going to get started here this morning. Second Timothy chapter number one. Uh, we're having technical issues with the streaming uh, on this morning, so we will have the audio. Um, if you sit next door, you'll have a camera picture because that part's working, but for some reason the computer side isn't working. So it's just us today, and we'll uh, have, I think Ricky put a note on the website for folks, but we will have the audio up. Uh, and so forth. First, uh, Second Timothy chapter 1, uh, we're going to go back in and finish up verse number 7. We didn't get to finish there about the sound mind. We're going to do that. Verse 7, uh, verse, verse 7 starts with that, for, for God hath not given us a spirit of fear. And again, that for is a particle of, of uh, further explanation. So in order to understand what the for is for, you got to go back and read verse 6. So, wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God, which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. For God hath not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And, and again, the reason for the call to Timothy to stir up the gift that's in him is because of that, for God hath never given us the spirit of fear, and that issue of the spirit of fear. So the, the intimidation factor of the satanic policy of evil, that attack against, that two-prong attack is underway. Plan A is to attack the message. It is to go after the message. It's to cause the message to be corrupted. It's, it, uh, come over to Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter number 11, and look, if you will, at verse number 6. Romans 11 and verse number 6. It, to corrupt the message, it's not very difficult when people aren't paying attention to the message. Romans 11, verse 6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. So if you want to mess up the message of grace, what do you add? Works. So when you, I, I, I hear people, oh yeah, we're grace believers. Okay, great. And then they add a bunch of works to the system. Then you're not grace believers. You might be dispensationalist, because you can be a mid-acts dispensationalist and not be a grace believer. You can. You can identify that with Paul starts a new something new in a dispensation, and then, and by the way, you can actually preach Paul's gospel. Christ died for your sins, was buried and rose again the third day, and believe, faith in that alone, and then turn right around and require a bunch of works. So what did you just do? <laughs> you just corrupted everything, you know. And it's amazing to me. I I I know people who will, yeah, we got a good grace church and blah, 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 you know, and, uh, and then you go listen or you go ask or talk and they got you doing a bunch of stuff and they don't have, they, they don't take grace to the next step and that's into the life. So the satanic policy of evil, the attack against the message is on. It's already going. But then here in 2 Timothy 1, the focus is going to be really on the plan B. And that's the attack on the messenger. Again, this is Paul's last epistle. It's a personal note, to, a personal letter really to Timothy about the last days and the condition in the body of Christ and the dispensation of grace. And he, that's what he's talking to Timothy here about stirring up the gift and remembering the unfeigned faith. Why? Because Timothy has a tendency to neglect the gift and let it kind of die down. And Paul... But there's an onslaught, there's, a, there's, a, there's an attack that's happening. And that attack by the adversary is to cause you to be discouraged. It's to cause you to, to slow down, to quiet down, to not speak up, to just let things ride. That's why I used last week the illustration of evangelism. Evangelism it, it used to be that uh, militant, aggressive you're going to die, you're going to go to hell, has anyone, you know, you're just on them, you know, has anyone loved you enough to ever ask you where you'd spend eternity? Well, then 
people started getting offended by that. And in Christendom and in church leadership, it was, well, we don't want to offend people. We want to be welcoming to people, and we want to have them come and be a part and do. But so we're not going to use the words hell. We're not going to be aggressive with it. We're going to have what they called it friendship evangelism, and we're just all going to be friends. And then in the course of conversation, we might bring it up and we might not, you know. And, and, and when you come to Scripture, it isn't that way at all, actually. And so you begin to soften the, the, the gospel message. And in Scripture, God would have all men to be saved. How do you get saved? Well, you recognize you're a sinner, and that has a consequence of hell. But there's an answer in the Savior, see? And then it's you just trust in Him. Well, when you get away from those basic little things, what begins to happen is, you you begin to you you begin to be quiet about things. It's an interesting. By the way, if you look back up at verse, two, I'm in Second Timothy one now. If you look back up at verse two, you know how he says grace and peace and mercy. When Paul talks about grace and peace and all the, the other epistles, that is our message to the world: grace and peace. That's our me- that you know, I said it last week. We have the right message from the right book with the right spirit. Has anyone loved you enough to ask you, where would you spend eternity? See, when you say things like that, people got to think about that, you know. And when you get into this, the issue here in 2 Timothy, and the issue for us going forward, as Paul paints the picture of what the dispensation of grace is going to look like going forward. He's dying. Is going to be one of, 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 a soft, of a soft pedal. If you look over at chapter 4 of 2 Timothy, chapter 4, verse number 3, for the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. That's, that is a softening of the doctrine. That, it, that isn't looking at someone and telling, look, when we struggle with sin, what does Romans 6 teach us? I'm kind of off here a little bit, but look back at Romans 6. Romans chapter 6. When, when people struggle with sin, there is a tendency to soften that struggle by looking at them and saying, "Well, you know, we can you can work this out together," and just and, and becoming a becoming weak in the matter. But look at Romans six. Look at what how he says. I'm looking for another verse here. So hang on. <laughs> Look at Romans 6. Look at verse number 7. For he that is dead, so what are we talking about? Verse 6, right? Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Is that pretty clear? For he that is dead is freed from sin. That's really clear, isn't it? It is to me. So when people say, well, Rick, I'm having a hard time, I'm struggling with this, and I look at them and say, well, just stop it. Stop. Oh, well, it can't just do that. It's do- No, you've been conditioned by the world to need helps to stop. You have the help in your identity and who you are in Christ to do what? To stop. We tend to have, in today, and I'm only talking about today, we tend to have this codependency. we got to depend on little gimmicks to get us to stop. What does the verse say? You're freed from sin. Sin doesn't have the power over you anymore. If you look down at verse 14, for sin shall not have dominion over you. Why not? For you're not under the law, but you're under grace. 
See, but what do we do? See, I say that to people. Oh, you're harsh and you're mean, you're unloving, you're unkind. No. Learn who you are. Know ye not that, verse 3, know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his, what, death? Baptism, the issue of identification there. You need what you need to do. You need to be quiet. You need to go figure out and learn about who you are in Christ. And what you quickly understand is your dependency becomes upon Him. Not little gimmicks, not little trinkets, but Him. And when you look at and you say, you know what? He's my source of life. He's my source of then when the sin shows up, you're not sitting there going, oh, no, here it comes again. You're not falling, you know, falling to pieces. You're looking at it and going, look, that's what my Savior died for. And you put it away. You follow that? Come over to Titus. I was looking for that verse in Galatians a minute ago. He says, I tell you the truth, am I your enemy? <laughs> you know? Well, in this day and age, come over to Titus 2, when you do tell people the truth, you know what you become? You become their enemy. Because they've been, they've had that, it, and, and by the way, this will get into the sound mind here in just a minute, because when you allow to come into your thinking is what then is going to dictate how you're going to respond to things. So if you're letting Christian dumb, the religion, the system out there, influence, then what are you going to begin to do? You're going to begin to soften the doctrine instead of standing for it. Titus 2, verse 11, 12, and 13, or three, or, well, 13 and 14, are three verses that are wonderful verses, little, little verse, verses that kind of crystallize what grace is all about. 2.11. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. There's phase one. That's justification. Notice the, the tense of that verse is past tense. He hath appeared. He's done. Never going to have to do it again. He died once. Verse 12, 12. Teaching us. Well, the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared. There's justification. The grace of God then is now going to teach us something, isn't it? There's sanctification. Here's the present, phase two. It's going to teach us, what's that next word? Denying. When you deny something, what do you do? You stop it, don't you? Last weekend we had the, the RV parked out here. We were denying, we were we, we are trying to deny access, aren't we? We're trying to do what? Stop them. Stop. Denying ungodliness and worldly lust. We should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. What does the grace of God teach us to do? It teaches us, if you're dead to sin, you're what? You're freed from it. But where is this resource? Folks, you can't do this on your own. You have to do it in who you are in Christ. And your resource has to be Him. By the way, verse 13, looking for that blessed hope and glorious appearing, there's phase three, there's our glorification, that's the looking forward, <laughs> the future. So when you come into 2 Timothy 1, God didn't give us the spirit of fear, that spirit of intimidation, that spirit of, of, of shutting down, but rather he gave us the spirit of power and the spirit of love and the spirit of a sound mind. He, he, rather, he, he equipped us with three integral, critical components. The power, and, and we looked at the power and the love last week, but just to kind of get you in your, back in your thinking, power. That's spiritual power. It's not economic power. It's not political power. It's spiritual power. It's the power of God unto salvation, Romans 1 says. It's the power over sins and sinning and the old man. It's the power over false doctrine. It's the power over the world and over the satanic policy of evil. You've been translated 
from the power of darkness into the glorious kingdom of his dear son. It's the power, it's having the power in suffering too, by the way. We'll get down in verse 8 next time about that. So where do we get our power from? Well, it comes from him, doesn't it? And it's by his word that he has given us that spiritual power, that spiritual dynamic in our life that we don't need to be intimidated by anything in life because we have, we're living in the light of what God's Word has said to us. And it's that power of His Word working in us who believe. 1 Thessalonians 2.13 Then he says he gave us a spirit of love. That's the motivation. The love of Christ constrains us. That's the because we thus judge the thinking process of, hey, we're doing this, we're going, we're moving forward. Why? Because we know, we understand the love of Christ. Then he talks about the sound and of a sound mind. And when, when he talks there about of the sound mind, that word sound, it's healthy. Uh, if you come back to chapter 6 of 1 Timothy, it's healthy. It's sane, sanity. <laughs> uh, in, in chapter 6, he uses a word in verse 3, If any man teach otherwise and consent not to wholesome words, words that bring nourishment, That's that issue of soundness, a sound mind, a a, a mind that, again, a thinking process, but that is sane, it's stable. Come back with me to Isaiah 26. By the sound mind word there, I have Isaiah 26 and verse number 3 written down. Isaiah 26 and verse number 3. Um, thou will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Look at that. Thou shalt keep him in what kind of peace? Perfect peace. People today, bad, want to have peace in their life. 26.3. Isaiah 26.3. People want to have peace. They're dying to have some peace. For parents, it's peace and quiet. (laughs) They're they're looking for peace. Where do you get the peace from? Where do you get perfect peace from? Whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. Now, that's an interesting thing there, because... When you fix your mind on what God says, and you're trusting in what God says, then guess what you don't have? The spirit of fear. You don't have the spirit of intimidation. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. You don't have the emotional roller coaster. You're not up and down. Now, you may be in a, an emotional roller coaster, but you don't have to be. You, you can look at it and you can say, you know what? We're talking about that thing about power over sin. You can look at that sin and you can say, that's sinful. That's what hung my Savior. I'm not going to do that and go the other way. But what told you that was sinful? And what, who told you to go the other way. Well, that comes from the sound mind. That comes from 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. That comes from understanding who you are in Christ and going, you know what, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go do this. 1 Corinthians 2, verse 16. For who hath known the mind of the Lord, that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. That's a wonderful verse. We have the mind of Christ. We have the Word of God. We have the book in which is the thinking of the Lord Jesus Christ. We have His plan. We have His purpose. We, in, in Scripture, we have what He hates. 
We have what he loves. We have how he thinks about things. We have the mind of Christ. We have it. It's in the Word of God, isn't it? With, okay? That's why right division is so critical. And why it's so important. Because if you don't rightly divide, we have the mind of Christ. If you don't rightly divide it, then what are you off doing? You're off thinking you're somebody you shouldn't be thinking you are, and you're off doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. So we take the Word of God, we separate it out, we divide it out where it belongs, so that we can understand who we are and where we are, and then be able to think about things rationally and sanely, soundly. Okay? And what happens is, is when you have this issue of a sound mind, you have the ability to discern things. You have the ability to properly evaluate life, ministry, the messages you're hearing, what's going on. So that you don't get what? Discouraged. So that you don't get intimidated. So that when you look at things and you go, wait a minute... I said it last Sunday, we were talking about the sound mind in the second hour. And, and I said, it, when you look at the news, that is stuff is fake. Now, it might have really happened. Did the shooting in Texas really happen? Yes. But that's not real. What's real? This is real. What's going to last for eternity? That or this? This is, see? That's, and that's what I meant by that is, yeah, that, those events in life happen, don't get me wrong, but what is real? What's going to be impacting? So rather than get all wrapped up in all of that, get wrapped up in this. See, what, are you able, what brings you to that conclusion is that you're able to properly discern and evaluate what's going on. Why? Because we have the mind of Christ right here in the book. So you've got to have the right book, King James Bible, but you also got to be able to take that book and study it the way God wants it to be studied. And when you do that, again, understanding right division isn't so that we can win arguments and influence people and be right. It's so that we, we come to our lives, we have and understand what's going on and who we are and where we should be and what we should be doing. So Paul, come back over there to 2 Timothy, tells Timothy, stir up that gift. Have a sound mind, Timothy. Have the spirit of, have that power that comes from the word of God working in you that then is going to motivate you out of, a, out of a love, the love of Christ to live as who you are in Christ, and then have that sound mind. That, that You take that information, and then you bring it into life, and you evaluate life. And that leads us to a walk of faith, which then results in up being no discouragement, no disillusion, no going, woe is me even though in the moment sometimes we do that. Come back over to Ecclesiastes in chapter 8. Ecclesiastes. It's Ecclesiastes 8. When you talk about the spirit of power, the spirit of love, and the spirit of a sound mind, you, they are intri- they're, 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 uh, connected. Chapter 8, look at verse number 4. Where the word of a king is, there is what? Power. Now, I know the guys that use this about the King James Bible, and you know they run with it, and that's not what the verse is talking about. Sorry to bust you on that. But where the word of the king is, what is there? There's power. Who's our king? The Lord Jesus Christ is. He's king of kings. He has given us the power in his word, 
that comes from him being king of kings. Now look down at chapter 9 of Ecclesiastes and verse 3. This is where it was headed. I just wanted you to see that thing in 8.4. Talking to some guys on Facebook, or not really, I'm not talking to them, I'm just reading the comments, and, wow, where the word of the king is, there's power, and see the King James Bible, and it's like, guys, Solomon had no idea about who King James was. <laughs> Sorry, you know. But he understood who the king was. He understood what he was. Ecclesiastes 9, look at verse number 3. This is, an evil, this is an evil among all things that are done under the sun, that there is one event unto all. Yea, also the heart of the sons of men is full of evil and... Madness is in their heart while they live, and after that they go to the dead. Now, that's an interesting verse, okay? But notice something in the verse. Notice the evil. They're full of evil, and madness is in their heart. Evil, sinful thinking, sinful activity. Now, what I want you to sh- I want to show you something here is... We are to have a sound mind. We're to have the mind of Christ, that thinking process, that evaluation, uh, that, that sieve, that cauldron that you're going to put every, that screen you put everything through. But there is an opposite thing out there. Okay? Ecclesiastes 9 3, the evil, the sinful thinking, the sinful activity that leads to madness. Madness is the opposite of a sound mind. Sinful, sin, will give your mind, will make your mind go mad. Last week we were looking there at Proverbs 28, and the guilty will always, they'll always run, even when nobody's chasing them. <laughs> you know, they're, they're guilty, so what are they doing? But what that sinful activity has led to some madness, which is the opposite of a sound mind. The sound mind, the the mind of Christ, gives us the ability to think properly, soberly, righteously, evaluate down. Now, think about this madness. Come over to Acts chapter 26. Because Paul makes an interesting connection and correlation to the issue of madness. Acts 26 Paul is standing before Agrippa. He's giving a recount of the, uh, really, he's defending himself. And in his defense, he gives an accounting here of, uh, of, of his life. Acts 26, we're just going to jump in at verse 11. And I punished them, and that'll be the saints there in Jerusalem in verse 10, 9 and 10. And I punished them oft in every synagogue, and compelled them to blaspheme. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. When he says exceedingly mad, he's not talking about being angry and just blowing his stack because he's angry, you know, road rage. He's talking about an irrational hatred for them that comes from a madness of thinking. Because when he looked at those who worshiped and followed Jesus of Nazareth, he didn't look at them and say, oh, just those misguided. He looked at them and said, we have to wipe them out. We have to annihilate them. We have to, and and he got that from a madness of thinking. Something going of, 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 a, of a, a mind that, can, that does not have the ability to properly evaluate the situation. A madness. Look down at verse 24, because Festus is going to pipe up here. And he said thus, and, and as he thus spake for himself, Festus said with a loud voice, Paul, thou art beside thyself, much learning doth make thee mad. (laughs) Festus looks at Paul and says, dude, you are out of your mind, man. Because he's just given him this great exhortation about the heavenly vision and everything. 
And you're just nuts. Now, but watch verse 26, because watch Paul's response. For the king knoweth of these things, before whom also I speak freely. For I am persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him. For this thing was not done in the corner. Well, you know what? I, I skipped verse 25. I'm sorry. I need verse 25. But he said, the he there is Paul. He said, I am not mad, most noble Festus, but speak forth the words of truth and soberness. You know what Paul says? Festus, I'm not mad. I'm not beside myself. I'm not a crazy man. I'm, I've, I'm, in, my, I'm in my right mind very much so here. Because I have figured out what's going on. I have a sound mind now. When Festus looked at Paul, the world looks at Paul, Festus looked, what did they think he was? A crazy man, a lunatic. But what was reality? Soberness, truth. Soundness. So there is an opposite thing going on here to the power of the sound mind. So when you come back to chapter 1 and verse number 7, when Paul looks at this and he says, Timothy, 2 Timothy 1, verse 7, we have been equipped to stand against that satanic attack. That's aimed at you personally, Timothy, to get you to be quiet, to get you to slow down, to get you to neglect, to get you to stop. And the message itself, we've been equipped to come up and to say, nope, we're good to go. We're in the right place. We're in a good place. The the assault on the doctrine, on the message, has been underway since day one. It's winning the battle in 2 Timothy. But here now, the attack here, again, the emphasis here in 2 Timothy is that seduction away from, that, that attack on the messenger to discredit him, to discourage him. Come over with me to back to 1 Timothy chapter 6 and just notice this. So when you th- think about this, and, and I'm looking at the clock trying to figure out how much we want to get into some of this, but l- look at 1 Timothy 6. Go back into verse number 3 here because this is what the link is into 2 Timothy. Verse 3, if any man teach otherwise, and the otherwise there is the stuff that Paul's been teaching them. That's chapter 1, verse 3, this, any contrary to sound doctrine. Teach no other doctrine. And consent not to wholesome words. Words that produce soundness, that produce a sound mind. Even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and again, that's 1 Corinthians 14, verse 37, though that is the, if, if any man think himself to be spiritual or a prophet, Let him acknowledge that the words that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. So those words here, talking about the words that the Lord gave to our Apostle Paul, those words are designed, the end of verse 3, and to the doctrine which is according to godliness. They're designed to bring you to godliness. Watch verse 4. What kind of a guy is he? He He is proud knowing nothing but doting about questions and strifes of words. Notice he's someone who doesn't, someone who doesn't consent, someone who doesn't acknowledge, is a proud, rebellious, know-nothing, and you ought not be listening to him. And yet, what do we do? We listen to him because we don't want to offend him. We don't want to make him feel bad. We don't want to, and we still like them on Facebook, and we still follow them, and we still give them the attaboys, and yet we're, 
you should just you should have cut them off at the knees and called them shorty. You should just let them go. Okay? You work on that one, all right? <laughs> Jerry's writing that one down. Okay? <laughs> All right, but see, the thing is here is, what is he? Verse 4, he's proud, knowing nothing, but doting about questions and strifes of words, whereof come envying, strife, railings, evil surmising, perverse disputings of men, of corrupt minds, and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. And the admonishment is from which, uh, from such withdraw thyself. Notice the, the whole corrupt system thinks this way. They think that gain is godliness. That's the whole system out there. So we have a system of a sound mind, of, of, a, of a way of looking at things, and then we got a system out there that says, nope, it's in the gain. And... It, it, Come back, come back with me to first, uh, second, uh, second Corinthians 12. So this guy, the system says the gain is godliness. The system says, hey, attendance is up. Money, the offering plates are full. The, uh, the bank account's flush. The bills are paid. Boy, God's blessing you. Boy, God's doing you, doing you good down there. And, you, and we look at that, and what does that, what does that cause sometimes in our thinking? A little, hey, wait a minute, what, what's wrong with us? What are, what are we doing wrong? Why aren't we, why isn't God blessing us? Look around, you know, we got, we got a few people here this morning. That's a good crowd, you know. What, what's going on? Well, look at 2 Corinthians 12 with me. Because the sound mind is going to, Pipe up here. 2 Corinthians 12, and look at verse number 9. And just notice how and where God works. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So let me ask you something. If somebody's out there... How does God look at this? Strong, rolling, bold, or over here in the weak? He looks at the weak, doesn't he? What does your flesh say? Don't look weak. You need to look Superman. You need to look strong and look, you know, what is the law of nature? Only the strong survive, okay? And, and you, you know, I mean, you go out there and you look around and, and, and the animal kingdom has it down right. <laughs> you know, if you're weak and hurt, you're gonna, you're done. <laughs> okay, and I understand, but that's your flesh says that. But what does God's word? What does a sound mind say? Sound mind says, I don't need to look bold. I don't. I. 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 You, you, this is going to look weak and fragile. So where would you rather be, big, bad, and bold, or weak, fragile? I'll take the weak and the fragile. Why? Because what does his word say? Then it becomes about his strength. That's why Paul will go on and retort in that verse and say, Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities. That, the reason I have this mindset the reason I have this thinking is that I know that the power of Christ will rest on me. And He's my resource. And He's my source of life. I'm going to depend on Him. So the sound, why He gave us a sound mind was so that we would think on things with a divine viewpoint rather than a human viewpoint. We would have the ability to properly evaluate ministry and life, and the messages that we hear. Because God, grace teaches us that God's strength is in weakness. So when we look at the ministry, 
the messenger, the message, the life around us. We should look weak and fragile rather than bold and unmovable and big. Now, don't get me wrong. You know, we need to pack the house out every service because then we're out doing our jobs as ambassadors. But when the world looks at us, that verse over there in Philippians, we've looked at it the last two weeks, it looks unto them as perdition. See, you guys are wrong. Look, what do you mean you only have 50 or 60 people? Man, we got we started that on our first Bible study in our living room. We're 6,000 now, <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I remember one time when I, at home at Shorewood, and when we were down on Neva and down in the city, and one of the guys was talking, and, and he had run across some, uh, a guy that was asking about the size of Shorewood and everything, because and, they went from six, 6 to 60 to 600 to 6,000, you know, over the span of a couple years. And the gentleman retorted. He said, yeah, well, there's a church right down there. And, and by the way, they did that through marketing and outreach and, you know, outdoing. He goes, yeah, but there's a church right down there that they got... They got, they got about 12,000 to 15,000, and they do no advertising. They do no promotion. They just have mass about eight times on Saturday. So who's winning this, you know? So you, he was, the guy was condemning Shorewood for being so small and really for standing on the truth, and, and yet there's the, the Catholic church down the street that they do none of that, and what do they pull in? <laughs> they, they're out doing the big churches, aren't they? Well... Why? Because what do we have to look like? We've got to look strong. The sound mind comes in and says, wait a minute, how does God look at this? He doesn't look at the big. Chapter 6 of 1 Timothy again, what's, he, what's the mind of these guys say? Gain is godliness. Say, Wow. You guys got a big campus. You got this, you got that. Boy, God's but Has God already blessed us? Oh, yeah, he has. More than you and I ever deserve for him to take care of us. But he does it because where are we? In his son. And when he gave his son, he gives us. So when you look at this issue of a sound mind, we have, go back to 2 Timothy 1, in when verse 7, when he says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind, we have the capacity of a sound mind that allows us to take God's word, the power, and apply it by faith. Folks, this is a walk of faith to every situation in life, and then we come to a conclusion from the Word of God on how God's Word and how God's mind and how God's thinking would have a, would have, we come to a conclusion, the same conclusion He comes to, we come to. Follow that? That's what we have in these three. All of it is based on our faith resting in the Word of God. All of, our, all of this rests on 1 Thessalonians 2.13, that the Word of God works effectually in them that believe. The hardest thing to get people to understand, the hardest thing to get you people to understand, is you got to believe the verse. That stuff in Romans 6 about sin and power over it, if you don't believe those verses, it won't work in your life. You believe those verses, then guess where you go? You go to Philippians 1, verse 9 and 10, where now instead of worrying about is my activity sinful, now you're worried about which is the more excellent way to have my activity be. You're not even thinking about the sin thing. The sin thing doesn't even come up. Because where are you at? Your activity is being driven by a mindset of, who you are in Christ, rather than a mindset of, yeah, I'm in Christ, but boy, my sins got me. Then there's a, you don't understand something. 
You're not, you're not believing the condition that you're in. You've put a thing on it. Okay? Follow, we don't, God didn't give us that intimidation. He gave us the thing of some victory. Because now in verse 8, chapter 1, verse 8, Be not there, thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel according to the power of God. Now we'll pick this verse up next time, but when you look, look at what the adversary wants you to be, verse 8. He wants you to be ashamed. He wants you to be intimidated. He doesn't want you out talking to people. When he says, I don't want you to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, there's the attack on the message. The testimony of the Lord. The word of the Lord. Nor of me, his prisoner. There's the attack on the messenger. What do you mean you follow Paul? Who's Paul? He's the 13th apostle, don't you know? He just continued what everybody else was preaching. And they do what? They attack him. Don't you know he was a jailbird? He's always in jail. You follow a jailbird? You follow a male chauvinist pig? He hates women. Don't you know that? Tells them to be quiet. You can't do that today. Really? When we had our paperwork for our Constitution reviewed, I got called on the carpet about no women on the board and in leadership. I'll, you better be careful with that. I said, dude, if you're telling me I got to have a woman in here, then we just quit right now because it ain't going to happen. He's like, well, you can't have that attitude. I said, it's not an attitude I cannot have. It's scriptural. It's what the verses tell me. And by the way, it's what the people want. <laughs> so just pull your lawyerism back in a little bit, you know. But I just want to make sure it was we we're going to be okay out there in the public. But you know what happens? The attack comes on. Ooh. Is there anything? There's, there's nothing wrong with women being in leadership, just not in the local assembly. Why? Because God's word says you don't go there. Okay? It isn't. I mean, I, I was watching a thing this past week. The state of Arizona leads the country with women in politics, and leadership positions. And with Flake's senator spot open, that will be the first woman senator from the state of Arizona of all ever. There's never been one. And they're talking the politics year 2018 and 2020 being the year of the woman in politics. You have, yeah, I think it's real sad. Not that the women aren't capable and can't do it, but where are the men? Where are the guys? Because their role in, in scriptural role is to be the leaders. It isn't nothing against the women. I, I mean, there's plenty of good and qualified and fine women, but where are the men? That's my, you know, well, I'm, where, where, well I know where they're at. They're not, they don't want to be out there because then the closets get open. Verse 8 we'll pick up with next time because what is the adversary going to do to you? He's going to come after you. And he's going to do it in a manner. So you, in order to get eight, you've got to have seven under your belt. What do we have? We've got power. We've got the power base and the Word of God. We've got a, the right motivation, the love of Christ constraining us. And we're doing it with the proper thinking process to evaluate life and what's going on and look at it and say, that's what we're going to do, or that's not what we're going to do. Because now, in verse 8, you begin to get the specific attack on the message and the messenger. And we'll look at that next time. Because he's going to give the answer to it all in verse